Hey, good morning, greetings and salutations and good everything. Good everything. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you this beautiful day? I was uh, just sharing with you a little self-care that we have to uh, lean into as we wait for people to uh, get their seats in the front mm -hmm. pew. Mm -hmm. You know, as we, wait, <laughs> as we wait for the congregation to file in, you know, yes, I, I was just yes. telling you, I, I had a little ripping and running to do this morning and I had time to take a sauna. So I'm, I'm very refreshed. You yeah. made time. You I, made made time. Time. I made time. Right. Yes. Um, it's funny. Uh, I have this young man on the show on Fridays named Roderick Morrow, and uh, mm -hmm. he's just uh, a pleasure uh, of a human being. Yes. Uh, but he was talking. He's not the black guy who tips. Yes, he is the black guy who yes, tips. Yes, 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 yes. He is so funny. I like him. Brilliant dude. He makes all the connections. I'm like, where do you find these cats? <laughs> it's beautiful. The internet is one of the... One of ah, the yes, of course, of uh, course. But of also, course. I mean, he's done a podcast for 15 years, and I think about doing a podcast before podcasts were... Um, ubiquitous. It seems like everybody and their mother has a podcast now. Mm -hmm. um, and what it takes to be in a business, because this is how he makes his money. He doesn't have a job. You know, that's a job. That's a, job. It's it's a, a, job. That's a mission, right? For 15 years to do something with your wife, which is a whole other thing, right? So he's married and uh, is and still married and still likes her, you know, after 15 wow. years of working together. Um, but they built a business that is a little mini empire. And I was just thinking about him yesterday because he was talking about time and how, you know, he, he had a meeting to go to and there was construction or something that he thought was construction. And he was about to get stressed out and frustrated, but he was like, what are the consequences of me being late? And I was just thinking about how, you know, we have the joke in our community about CP time and we we did a whole i know we've talked about this and among the 209 now no, classes no. with you but no. it was funny yesterday when he said it because i was like everything we do even our work schedule is based on the plantation and enslavement and um and i said so when you got there was it okay he was like yes and then i found out there was a fatality right so those two people that whatever the road was blocked for to clear the road of the accident that killed two people. He said, they will not get to enjoy the rest of their day. And so, you know, we rip it around, you know. They won't be on this side. On this side, right. So, My you know, goodness. My goodness. Mm. So I just thought about, you know, time and and how we value ourselves and, and the time that we have here on this earth and what we do mm. with it and, you know, what's really meaningful. So I, I just brought that up. Um, yeah. Because, you know. The, uh, the question of as you say, the schedules. I mean, I, I kind of embrace CP time in the sense, in two senses, as we talked about many times. One, because we're the few, first humans to find ourselves in time and space and then set forth the rhythms that we maintain to this day, the clock, the calendar, all those African inventions. And the other reason is that, um, as my dear friend Aisha Imani <clears throat> in Philly, master teacher and the founding uh, director of the Sankofa Freedom Academy, um, I hadn't thought about that. I wasn't going to mention, uh, hadn't thought to mention her this morning, except in this context. And I actually have on the Afrocentric Nubian sweatshirt from uh, from uh, Columbus Afrocentric High School, which is one of the oldest Afrocentric high schools in the city. I mean, in the country. But uh, Aisha would always say when I would visit her when she was running the Masterminds Charter, uh, the Masterminds uh, Small Learning Community at William Penn High School down the street from from Temple when I was in grad school, I went in there once a week and do black history with her. She, uh, we would be in there in conversation, debate, talking about topics and issues and the bell would ring and nobody would move. And so all the other students from the other periods would be coming and you see them crowded around the door, getting ready to come in. And Aisha would be like, okay, finish your points, sweetheart. And the, the young person would make their points, okay. All right, well, we'll see y'all tomorrow. And everybody would leave. And I said, Aisha, how are you doing? She said, we're human beings. We have relations with each other, not a clock. Come on. Yeah, it was so It was so brilliant. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, mean, this, I, I think it was Doc, Dr. Daniel Black the last time he was on my show. Um, he said, I operate. There's Kronos time, and then there's there's another time. And I can't remember. Mm. It begins with a K. Move around uh, in my okay. so it was, I was like, oh, and he said, you operate on that other time. 
and and it extends beyond the clock as we spring forward this week. I don't even know. I'm getting tingles right now because we ain't even playing. Y'all, we supposed to talk about the State of the Union. We're going to talk about the clock. We're about to spring forward in this craziness of, of time that, that man has manipulated. So we're going to lose an hour uh, t- tonight, tomorrow, whatever. But he said there's two, you know, there's Kronos time and then there's the other time. What is it? Dr. Carr, help me, please. What is it? No, no, this is actually, this is a book. I mentioned it before. It's called Kronos, The West Confronts Time by Francois Hartog. Hartog is a French uh, professor. He's at the Ecole de Haute Etude en Science Sociale in Paris. Okay. Very interesting guy. He's talking about how Western concept of temporality, how we deal in time and space, differ. And he's looking at the genealogy, beginning, of course, with how the Greeks understood time. And he looks at he's focusing on Christian time, time in the in the early years of the Catholic Church. And he talks about how. Western Christianity established a. um, A concept of time that kind of dominated European thinking for centuries, but in the contemporary era. That has been replaced over the last half millennia or so by a notion of what he calls relentless progress. The Western concept is is anchored to relentless progress. So when you mentioned it, we talked about this. Yes. Let me just just say uh, thank you, Nubians, because I I had to pop in. Is Kronos time and Kairos time? Kairos. Kairos? Does that ring a bell? Yes, Kairos. Thank you, Vernon, and everyone else. That look, and yeah. In fact, let me pull up. I pulled up the Nubia app on the uh, on the phone, and so now I'm, I'll pull the Nubia and the YouTube join up here on the computer. Yeah, Charmaine. I just want to shout out. Yeah, to thank you. you. No, it's this. This is this is where it gets, it's very interesting because I think about Dr. King talking about love I and mean, agape love. And I'm thinking one of these days. One of these days. Certainly, we continue to draw breath. We're going to lose all of those terms, all those Greek terms, because you can't escape. This is the point Jacob Carruthers is making again in Science and Oppression when he says that these Western concepts, again, grappling with control. These Western concepts link us to these Western world senses or worldviews, which is a cultural issue. And for Carruthers, he makes the observation in Science and Oppression that once you have distanced yourself from other people and made this about an abstract concept, you can then manipulate those other people if they buy into that same abstract concept. So now our God is the clock, Come on. not each other. And well, so it really, they're variations. Either one of those Greek terms are variations on the same cultural grounding. The illusion is that they differ from each other. But no, once you have no, and this is the challenge again, and I'm not gonna get into part no, no, let's get into it because I'm struggling to contain myself right now because just as you were saying that I realized in this moment that those are Greek terms, both of them, right? Of course. And and, and so I had, thing. let me tell you, I had a brother on was it this week or last week, a math, a math genius. I had a math genius on who comes hmm. from a, a line of math geniuses. From Philly, I think he worked with you in the Philadelphia Freedom Schools. Are you talking and, about Akil Parker? Yes, yes, I yeah. am talking yeah, about Akil. Yeah. Akil. Akil is the brother that founded all this math, does some yes. incredible work. In fact, he wants to to work with us. Yeah, good yes. brother. Yes. Yeah. So I had him on the show, and he was talking about you know you know how math we are math and math is ancient as you know the Africans that invented it, and we were talking about Pythagorean Pythagoras is you know, uh, Mm -hmm. theorem, but he didn't get it from Greece. He got Mm -hmm. it from his studies in Africa. And then I was thinking, I've been talking, you know, ruminating on, on Socrates who brought something into the Greek, uh, zeitgeist that didn't exist before that he got from Africa. And I think about how long Jesus spent in Africa. Y'all go ahead with that. And, and how we take these, you know, brilliant terms, but we don't credit the origin, the source, right? So Pythagoras didn't come up with that. He studied in Africa and Socrates didn't come up with the Socratic method. It was an African method. So I'm like, we need to start to erect the names. And he erected the brother who taught Pythagoras. And he had a Greek name because, you know, 
people going to name people, Toby, people going to name people, right? So Hunter and Carr and, you know, people going to name people. But, you know, I I, I want to know who, who started, you know, was there a particular group and should we start to do what they've done, which is to um, erect our own, not mythology, because these are facts. And this is what we do every every week and then every day, both of us separately. Um, but who came before Socrates? Where did he get that? And who came before Pythagoras? And well, this you know this again. It's it's difficult because it goes against all of our schooling. It goes against all of our schooling. It does. At the same time, it's very innate. It's very human for all humans on the planet to go against that schooling, schooling as a form of control to ask why origins become so important to us on the, on the larger human level. Saying something. Or, well, it's foundation. We, we know that. I mean, so the, 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 the power of origin is in the foundation out of which we all emerge. And it really puts everything we've done since we've emerged as a species and everything that has occurred since this reality we experience or perceive or try to label emerged in context. Because <clears throat> the things that have happened over the last however long, decades, centuries, thousands of millennia, you know, those things are very recent phenomena. The hard wiring that gave us fingers and, and mouths and voices, all that stuff, it's millions of years. And so it puts it in context. That's the most important thing. However, the trauma of our recent experiences, the things that fragmented us into concepts like race and ethnicity and these kind of things, and then put clusters of the species at a perpetual uh, dis not even disadvantage. It, it be, it, they put us, grouped us in a form where we'd be perpetually harmed. The response to that for those who are perpetually harmed is to seek to, uh, Jake really used to call it, fight our way back into history and Anderson Thompson and the Chicago group. And in fighting our way back into history, the danger is always that we mistake reestablishing the kind of natural rhythms of being in the world we conflate that or mistake that for trying to jump to the front of the line of the corrupt system that caused our yes. need to have to do it in the first place so when we start talking about origins for example if um you know, he was talking about you know obviously pythagoras you know there are no, there are no pyramids in greece obviously so when you start talking about measuring these triangles then you're you're talking abstractly, which is of course entirely possible, and and it's happened a lot. However, the Egyptians used applied math to do what they did. They had figured those things out millennia before. Now the question of who precedes Pythagoras, and I remember back in 1993, four, when Theophilo Benga was was at Temple, and you know Mario, Betty, Valithi, Wakas, myself, his, his students were clustered around him learning meta nature and he was teaching us attic greek and he was going with mario for hours over the university of penn copying all these egyptology books you know that foundation that you know mario has just continued to, to soar with i remember one day i was in his office because i was his stenographer like you know so he would come in and dictate his books to me because he he swore his english was not good and he wanted me to put the book that he had in his head into what he would call good English. But I would always laugh at it because this is a man who has mastered so many languages that, you know, I walk in to get ready to take some dictation and he would be in there writing Hebrew. What you doing? He said, I'm studying Hebrew. He would just pick up line. He has this, this gift line. Anyway, so I took it as an honor to be his, yeah, I'm anything you write. And I remember when he dictated the book that became a lost tradition, African philosophy and world history. And he wrote a chapter on Thales, Anaximander, um, Pythagoras, all of these early Greek figures. And it dovetailed quite nicely with what the late Martin Bernal wrote in Black Athena, which is the Greeks themselves would not have seen themselves as white. The Europeans made the Greeks white to give themselves a glorious past. But when you start looking at, so he said they weren't stealing they were learning from, and, and, and even in that process, uh, it is attributed to, I think it's uh, Solon was there. Was it Solon? But uh, one of the Egyptians said, you know, you Greeks are like children. 
you don't stay long enough to master the underlying reason for this knowledge. You get just enough and you take it back. But it wasn't a racial critique as much as it was a critique of their culture. And then Plato in his uh, uh, Scolia, this kind of, or not errata, but this kind of um, secondary writing, marginal writing that was collected in a volume. And I'll never forget the day that Dr. Obenga found an English translation of this volume. It was actually the day of Jacob Carruthers funeral in 2004. We were in Chicago at uh, this was after the repast, after the funeral. We, you know, milling around you know, before we go to the airport. And we went to Powell's bookstore on 57th Street. That's where Kim Delaney and I were. She took me over there before we went to the Dunbar. I got to come to Chicago, got to come to Powell's. And we were standing there. And I was actually so funny. I was telling these, uh, the guys that work at Powell's now, because I hadn't been in there since COVID, since the pandemic, this story. Because as I was preparing, I, look, this is this is generally my routine whenever I go to a city and, and this started places like Pals or the, and the Strand in New York. I'll go in, gather all the books I'm going to get, bring them to the front, tell them I'm usually on file with a lot of these bookstores. All right, you got, y'all got my address, ship everything except these two. I'll put two or three books in my bag and, and then I'll leave. And then the books show up whenever they show up back on, you know, on these coast. Anyway, I had to find out this time that since COVID, they stopped shipping. So that was like, wait, y'all don't ship no more? I said, no. I said, what the hell? So what he said, no, no, don't worry. Go down the street to the Kinko's, tell him you from past. So I went down there and this beautiful brother from the Caribbean just started laughing when I came in with this big ass box of books. So he shipped them. They, they came the other day. Anyway, I'm going around the point to, to, to point to the point. I was telling them this story because they were new and they didn't know me. That's why I said, oh, this is weird. Y'all know. Oh, no, y'all new, aren't you? Yeah, we, we just started working here a couple years ago. Okay. So y'all came during COVID. Mm -hmm. So I was telling them how long I've been coming to Pals. And I said, you know, I remember one time about 20 years ago, we stand here and Obingo finds this book. And I said, here we are, three black dudes standing up in the bookstore. And this older dude is running his finger across the Attic Greek and translating it in real time. <laughs> and he said, this is what I've been looking for to show y'all. He had read it before in other books, but he didn't have a physical copy of this book. Plato, it is attested to Plato that he said, the Egyptian education system helps us become more human. He said, compared to the Egyptian education system, the Greek education, he's translating from the Greek. He said, you see this word right here? He said, the, the Greek tr tr the education system is not fit for pigs. Now, this is in the Greek, so it's not a, it's not a, it's not a French or a Dutch or a, a German or English translation. It's the original Greek, and you can get those kind of because 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 Pals is kind of like a um a dump off site for scholars around the University of Chicago area. So a lot of linguists and stuff. So you get a lot of books in, on Egypt and Greece and, and and Rome in in the original languages. You see these things anyway. I bring all that up to say that when we start talking about who taught Pythagoras. Who taught Plato? Who taught Anaximander? Who, where did Thales get his concept of water in the new? The, the attestation of individuals in a genealogy is less important than the concept because this is where Bernal, for example, in, in, in Black Athena talks about competitive plausibility in linguistics. He would say, for example, the word philosophy doesn't seem to have linguistically a Greek root. However, in the Egyptian, in the Medunetra, you have a concept, Seba, which can be translated as star, which can be translated as teaching or learning. And he says, this concept seems to be, it's competitively plausible linguistically that this concept, which can also be translated as, as wisdom or acquiring wisdom, would be the root of Philae, Phila, Philo, you see that, love. But Sophia, the concept of wisdom, there's no there's no there's no genealogy to that in ebonics when they had the whole fight on Oakland over the question of whether ebonics was a language and they said y'all are saying it's genetic that it, that it's through the bloodline and the linguists are like yeah but we don't use genetic the way you use when you when you say genetic you mean bloodlines when we say genetic we're looking at genealogies of languages where did it come through genealogically in terms of languages but there's no genealogy according to uh, those who are studied the Greek language and, and studied Metanetra, which is an incredibly small number of people who studied both. Most people talking about Egypt can't read no Metanetra. And most people talking about Metanetra don't have any interface with Greece. This is what makes Obenga and his students so important. 
is that they can't trace it. But what Bernal, who could read both, says is that you see it's competitively plausible that the root of this word is in Egypt. And what makes it competitively plausible is that we know from their own writing that the Greeks were in Egypt studying and would come and bring it back. Now, I bring all that back around to what you and Akil were talking about. We keep searching for like smoking guns in part because we're fighting our way back into history. Yes. The, the real breakthrough will occur when we simply stand in our governance formations, engage our ways of knowing, which are unbroken, even though they've changed. And then when we turn to social structures we find ourselves in, we're in dialogue without first trying to fight our way into a system. No, we're not gonna, no, we're not gonna fight to it. Because that's how you know what a Martin Luther King. The genius of Africana cultural meaning making poured into Greek terms for love. No, brother, you don't have to do that. We're going to give you some metanature. And then when you talk to them, you can come in with your own foundation, as Zordon and Hurston say, every tub must sit on its own bottom. So it's an interesting thing we're having this conversation. Yes. This morning. Listen, yeah. I'm, I'm, I want to go and sit and think for the next rest of the day. Like, I don't even yeah. want to keep talking. Yes. Because you, you first of all, I, I want to apologize. What's because that? as soon as you said it, I said, of course, I am trying to establish our humanity and our history in this insane world that we're in by by saying we came first. Right. With everything. We all do it. We all do it. Right. Because we've been erased. Right. Exactly. So that, that desire <laughs> is, is, is quite natural. Oh, we think we've been erased. Right. See, that's the so, so there, there, there been you erased. go. So there you yeah. go. Right. But we see so, we're here. We evidence we are here. Here. And let me tell you, let me right. tell you how I know it's genealogy because there, it doesn't make any sense that a kill was on my show and you you know like there there, there are too many cross Absolutely. Um, you know our our lines have crossed we're here on Saturday none of this makes any sense mm -hmm. in the natural right so it has to be somewhere deep in our epigenetics that we must get back to the source of who we are and the very thing that you said about the Greeks this is who we are right now we take a little bit of something and we run. How many books, you know, I was just thinking because I'm getting back into publishing. There are so many books out there that we absolutely do not need because people just haven't done the work. So they're taking a little bit of something they read somewhere and they're bringing it back to master. Masters go, that's fascinating. Here's a book deal. And there's now 50, 11 books on the same topic, each one watered down like a carbon copy. Oh. And they don't go back to the, like, the, nobody has the answers. And it's so wild to me. So for me, it's about reclamation. I'm in this space because we're going to reclaim some things, right? Absolutely. But but for for this conversation that we're having today, man, it's so powerful what you said, because we don't have to beg for our humanity. It's just there. And just now, there. now the job is to have that tertiary, that that sit in the soil knowledge that That's the right. Greeks didn't have the discipline to, to have. That's Do we right. have the discipline, Dr. Carr? Do we have the discipline to sit in it long enough to know enough to 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 impart enough to 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 grow enough do we have it do we have it in us how many yeah. of us have it in us if we're being yeah. honest yes yes we do we wouldn't be doing what we're doing you wouldn't be doing what you're doing every day of the week at this point and me neither and and those of us who are in this space right now yes the answer is yes will we do it that's the challenge i mean we're about to start the second round of this africana studies course and it's going to be uh different because and then they're going to be parts that are the same because we have to continue. But yeah, that, that is the question. You've asked the question. You know, we, we, we it's here. And, and actually, that is the first question we have to answer for ourselves. The first question we have to answer for ourselves in the contemporary world is, do we, do we stand on the principle that it is there? that there is an unbroken element. And I'm glad you mentioned epigenetics. Again, thinking about my sister, Fatima Jackson, the biological anthropologist who helped set up the first DNA bank in Africa, worked on the New York African burial ground. Um, brilliant sister who talks about epigenetics, the thing that is in our genes that is passed on and up to and including memory. But that's not enough. That system has to be activated. And then so can we, can we imagine a, a process of recovery of that of that conscious memory and then building on that to, to this is where Du Bois who didn't have the tools in his age in his day even though he lived almost a century 
This is where Du Bois, as early as 1896 and 1897 with the conservation of races, and then reaching a mark in 1915 with the Negro, gesturing toward it the rest of his life, Black folk then and now, 1945, the world in Africa, Black Reconstruction, 10 years before, 1935, that final uh, speech he gave at John C. Smith, 1960, whether now or why, he gives his life over to the principle that it is there to be recovered and that recovering it isn't just an act of recovery for African people. It's the unblocking of our memory to continue to contribute to our common humanity because everybody on the planet does this. It's not even controversial anymore in, say, for example, the field of indigenous studies. So, you know, every human who was on this side of the ball when they were invaded that survives is now in the act of recovery languages that are being lost. No, no, hold on. There are two speakers. Let us go sit these children with them and let's get our scholars together and recover this land. Because when you lose a language, you're losing a worldview. You're losing world sense. It's not, it's not, it's not a controversy in Africa or Asia or these other places where people are saying these languages have to be studied and preserved because they're kind of it's a controversy when you start talking about Africans in places where we have been convinced there's nothing there to recover. Or that what we have developed since the trauma and during the enduring trauma is something that is of not only enduring value in the present, but that supplants and replaces any value of what we brought with us. This is the fundamental problem of the descendant of slavery argument in, 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 in a cultural sense. You know, you know, we help build this country. OK, you've opened your mouth. Your whole brain's on display. It's a big brain, but you're only using a fraction of it. Please apply a common sense question. If you are talking about your ancestors who were forced into this enterprise, answer this fundamental question. Did they have ancestors? And then and then so now you've made a value judgment. You want to start your genealogy with the trauma. And why would you cut off the entirety of your existence, which is all of your existence until just like that, for the just like that? That is a reaction to the social structure you're in. When you realize that and you begin to, to, to recover conscious knowledge of these ways of knowing you brought with you and how you've adapted them in this place, it's not going to diminish you. It's going to enhance you enhance your arguments, enhance your ability to be in the world, and also enhance the possibility that you can build a different future. To me, unless, this is, you know, unless, we, unless, we, unless, unless you have put your entire um, financial future in the framing of that. If that is the way you make your money, that is the way you you know, you, you make your livelihood. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult uh, thing to walk back from. Of course it is. You know, so so maybe, maybe you know in your heart of hearts what you're saying right now, Dr. Carr, is true. Mm -hmm. But you will talk to yourself into thinking you're the enemy, Dr. Carr, for bringing the truth. This happens all the time. How many of us have been in relationship with people and you tell them something that's absolutely true and good for them and they get mad at you? I don't want to talk to you and you're the problem, right? This, this happens a lot. So, you know. And, 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 and it's why, I mean, again, and it's amazing how fast time, well, no, no, time doesn't fly. It's amazing how our perception of time can make it seem as if no time has, uh, has passed between moments when we've been together. And here we are in 2024, fast, relatively speaking, approaching the next blurred kind. But in our conversation last year, when we were all physically together in Virginia, having this conversation about Afrofuturism, you know, at the end, and, it, and I'm so glad that you had our young people recording that conversation because that last part of it, Afrofuturism is escapism for people who don't embrace what you've just said. It can become a way to imagine a future that cuts itself off from its past. However, at its most powerful, and you know, Senyata was making this point among other people as we were talking last year, the more you have recovered your memory, the more the possibilities of your future become clear. So you're not inventing a Wakanda. You're not creating a rhetorical gesture in a comic book or a movie based on a very limited, dim, necessary, but insufficient awareness of a past. 
but you've actually engaged in what Jacob Carruthers would say, having your conversation with your ancestors without interpreters, which will then allow you to imagine a space program or to imagine an artificial intelligence that isn't uh, going to kill the species. Why? Because you grounded it in a foreknowledge that existed, not one you've projected backward because you didn't take the time to study. Uh, it, it takes what I suppose in a different context, um, uh, Valethea uh, was telling me the other day about a book she's reading. And of course I went and got the book and realized I had had an earlier uh, book by this guy. I didn't have this one, but this is Cal Newport's book, Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout. Mm. So Valethea was telling me about this book and this guy has written a number of books and we shared, a, uh, he did, a um, uh, there was a review in the New York Times the other day but I have one of his earlier books on uh, removing oneself from the digital world in a way that will allow your brain to recover. And the slow productivity of, you know, when we go to Kemet, these people didn't have these computers, didn't have the internet, didn't have YouTube, didn't have TikTok, none of it, didn't have Instagram. You can't build, as Obeni used to say, you can't build a pyramid by dreaming. To me, that's the salient critique of Afrofuturism. And in its in its trauma grounded sense, and people say it's not grounded trauma. Absolutely, it is because you've got all these images, but you can't do the math, which means that you have forsaken the slow learning for the image. And so now you can make some great songs, some great music, some great costumes, some great outfits. You can have these great music videos. But when it comes time to make that in reality, you still got to turn that over to your friends at MIT and Silicon Valley. Why? Because you didn't take the time to link. But but. When you see Kemet, you look at that pyramid, you say, okay, this was not a team of scientists sharing data on computers. These are people sitting, looking at the stars at night. How long did it take you to figure out the rotation of this ball you're on? And they knew it was a ball when we look at the nanometer. And you look at the sky and you say, those tree stars right there in that corner? That's what, you know, they would call the, you know, Mario does a whole lot on this in Metanetra class what he calls the imperishable stars. Those stars don't move. And then you start mapping things on the ground out to reflect what you're seeing in the sky. And that's how you end up with Hufu, Khafre, and Menkare, those three big pyramids on the Giza Plateau, lined up like them three stars right there. But it took how many thousands of years of watching the sky? You ain't built nothing. You're just looking and passing on what you saw. That's what Cal Newport might call in a limited European sense, slow productivity. And there's, a swath, you know there's, a, there's a swath of people that want to give that credit to uh, extraterrestrial beings. Of course. We are extraterrestrial. We all started us. We came from somewhere else. Thank oh, you. Oh, you. You don't mean us. You mean like aliens like... Oh my, like some, someplace else, else, right? As if we aren't capable of that. Which mm -hmm. tells you... And, and, and the, the, the fallacy is that we're somehow smarter than the people that built pyramids that we can't duplicate. That's when it when it actually is the, the opposite because we don't sit long enough to act to, to learn or and we we have been conditioned to um assume that our information is proprietary so we don't share anything it can only right. go to a certain handful of people just that's for not for everybody because you don't know who's going to have an imagination it could be a kid on the spectrum that sees things completely differently than you and I that can break forth something right. just because they're in community and has you know have been um you know, not indoctrinated, but, you know, in community and hearing and learning at the same time. And we don't read enough. We don't read enough fiction, which, you know, not only taps you into your humanity, but also helps awaken your, your imagination. Many of us believe that fiction reading is, you know, for the low vibrational folk or people who aren't that smart, that you, you have to read some academic stuff to be smart when it's probably the opposite. But, um, Hmm. It's interesting to me what uh, what you're saying. I want. I'm, 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 once you fractured it, the fracture it goes back to what you raised a minute ago. The fracture is the point that we have to now set aside, not set aside in terms of being denial, but confront and transcend. So by that I mean the fraction becomes really what i'm talking about in terms of fraction become becoming the problem the concept of academic writing fiction non-fiction writing these are unnecessary divisions 
that then if we start with those as the assumptions of how we organize ways of knowing, they can never be completely reconciled because we've assigned a value. This is again, when we return to our African studies course, when we get to the social structure, governance structure, ways of knowing, science, technology, the fourth category, and we read and discuss Jacob Carruthers 1972 essay, Science and Oppression. This is again where Carruthers is confronting this concept of ordinal classification. Once you fractured knowledge, you then start to rank it. So academic knowledge is better than non-academic or folk knowledge. Nonfiction is better than fiction. And if you just say, no, it's not better, it's not better or worse, it's just different. Yes. Is it different? Is it different all the time? First of all, when you've said fiction and nonfiction, what you've done is create a rupture. You've created a fracture. Now, can you confront and transcend that fracture? Maybe you can come up with better terms. Well, you can maybe say that some nonfiction is a metaphor. Some fiction is a metaphor for nonfiction. In fact, we're all dealing with symbol systems. Again, I think about a conversation I had a decade ago with the then dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Bernard Mayer, who was trying to understand and have a conversation with me. We have a conversation about whether Africana studies is an, is an art or a science. And of course, I reject the, the distinction between social sciences and humanities on this point. And so we're talking about this because they're going through program review. This is the continuing confrontation that makes it so exhausting in universities, which uh, where people are trying to justify, quote unquote, black studies programs by linking them to white studies programs and white studies programs are every other discipline in the university except black studies. But unfortunately for most black studies programs, there are also white studies programs in this, in this sense, that the ways of knowing are derived from the other academic disciplines. And they make the mistake of thinking that if it's sociology and it's history and it's literature or English, and, uh, or if it's biology, or if it's you know, any other for anthropology, that somehow you can call all of that if you're studying a black subject, black studies. And so black studies is interdisciplinary. No, it's not. Because all of those other disciplines are white studies. But this is not that because we've jailbroken the black university. We're standing in this foundation. But let me make that final point before I get to the point I want to make about this question, this conversation I was having with Dean Mayer. The point I want to make before I go back to that conversation, which I really haven't left, this is a footnote, is that when I say all those other academic disciplines are white studies. What I mean is that the ways of knowing that craft them out as variations on a central cultural way of knowing, that foundational way of knowing relies upon fracturing knowledge. Sociology is not history. History is not philosophy. And the philosophy was seen as the queen of the disciplines because are oh, you getting close? Philosophy, yes, a way of knowing. Love of not love of wisdom, philo, love, philae, love. Okay, Fila, love, love. Okay, Sophia. Oh, I don't see a genealogy for that. Oh, look to the Egyptian Seba. Oh, shit, that's, that's competitively plausible. So you're saying that wisdom as we understand it in Greece came from y'all? Hey, we're all humans and y'all came to us. We didn't come to you. Anyway, the point is this. Philosophy seen as the queen because it's a ways of knowing. That doesn't mean that this knowledge isn't valuable. It's incredibly useful. What it does mean is that it is maybe unnecessarily fractured. Now, Back to the conversation we're having with Dean Mayer. Dean Mayer is a mathematician by training, Bernard Mayer. And you know that 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 sorority and fraternity, that community, I'm taking away those Greek names, but that community of <laughs> mathematicians of African descent is small enough in the contemporary world so that they all know each other, or many of them know each other. So the previous dean, James Donaldson, my, my dear friend, now an ancestor, he knew Dean Mayer. I mean, they knew each other because they black mathematicians. Mayor's from the Caribbean. Uh, uh, well, in the media sense, African from the Caribbean, uh, James Donaldson, an African from uh, the United States, Florida in particular. And so, but they knew each other, generation apart, but they knew each other. So we're talking. Uh, and so I'm sitting in there because, we, you know, I, at that time I was chair of African States Department. And this is what I'm never going to do. I'm never giving that fight up. So if you think I'm ever going to give up the fight for black studies, as long as I'm working at a university, good luck, because we're going to dance till your feet fall off. But the point is this, we sitting there having this conversation and here's the program review. Okay, so you know, what discipline y'all in? I'm, I'm telling you, we're in the discipline of Africana studies. I know, but what parent discipline, what parent, my degree is in Africana studies. You understand? 
the limits of the university are that it's hard for y'all to understand it because you got to figure out a, a classification, humanities, social science. Once you've done that, you're creating, recreating what Jacob Carruthers talked about in science and oppression, this ordinal ranking. Because of course, if it's in the social sciences, it's better than the humanities. But of course, to be better would be the natural sciences, the physical sciences. So biology and chemistry would trump that, right? This is where when people say STEM, it's like, oh, but you left out the arts. Okay, we're putting in STEAM. No, you, what you did was an unnecessarily rupture in the first place. And once you've ruptured it, you got to keep adding letters to kind of round some out so anyway this is the punchline we sitting there talking and i said okay dean let me ask you a question i said you're a mathematician right he said yeah cool. yes dr carr I, I, i'm a mathematician i said um is math an art or a science he looked at me he said i see what you did there car it's very interesting you see that because i guess it, it, it would be both yeah it's both let me tell you why because numbers like notes on a page for music are just symbols representing something else. So when you're writing fiction, I've been rereading Du Bois's Dark Flame trilogy this week. Sequestered, leave the phone home. Du Bois said, I can't get to y'all with this nonfiction writing because you're coming in with an assumption. So what I need to give you is a metaphor. I'm going to trace three volumes, the history of African people from Africa all the way up to 1950, but I'm going to do it through the lives of all these characters. And you think that you're experiencing something that didn't happen, but I'm telling you all this happened, but I've had to take you away from you linking yourself to a system that's gonna rank you ordinarily. The same thing happens when we're talking about our people. So Afrofuturism is very powerful. It will be the power it needs to be, however, lies in the lived experiences of African people. And so we can look at Wakanda and say, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Now turn around, and build something based on that movie you saw. Not, not just create a costume, not just create, because you haven't left it yet. You've got to erase that fracture because what you're seeing, what you're reading is not only possible, it's inevitable if you will recover your memory. And he understood it immediately when we did like that. So I, I came in to ask a question because um, again, I probably do need to sit for the rest of the day and be out of here, uh, just processing. Don't worry, we're gonna get out of here in a minute, yes. Uh, I was thinking about all the people going to, to Africa to learn and then bringing it back, whether it was yes. the Greeks or the Hebrews or whomever, right? Yes. Taking stuff, bringing it back, you know, virgin birth, whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. y'all can look that up. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, you know, even the transatlantic slave trade, because I'm watching Shogun, right? I'm watching Shogun, and it's uh, this, this is based on a book, of course, and then uh, it's a series, a TV series, where the Portuguese and then the the Britons come into Japan, to these islands, yes, for for trade, right? And this kingdom is so ins insulated and brilliant. To your point, you know, there's the calligraphy, there's the martial art, the what well, we call martial arts, the, the the fighting, there's all of that, but it's holistic, right? There. There and, and the precision of how they build their buildings and all this. So the folk come in from other places, much the way as they were traveling, looking for spice. Yes. You know, it was like, what's going on? Gold was destabilized by one man. What's going on in this continent? Let's go see. When we have goodness and plentiful, um, you know, abundance, mm -hmm. we don't desire to go out any place else. It's only the hungry, starving, destitute people that go looking other places, right? When you are securing your thing you're not looking the J japanese weren't out there exploring like the vikings and all these other folk interesting with their trench mouth and stuff so i was just i was wondering can we get too comfortable at some point we're not there yet but you you said you don't like to be comfortable right we, no, we I, don't. I, I, right. I, I don't like to be i don't like to be in a situation that causes me to lose track of those who don't who can't be comfortable I was having that conversation yesterday. Actually, I was in downtown. I don't go anywhere. Just very quick uh, with a brother. Every uh, couple of times a month, there is a newspaper. In fact, I ha should have my copy. Yeah, here it is. There's a newspaper that is sold here in D.C. called Street Sense. You've heard me mention it before. This is a, a paper that is sold by vendors who are housing insecure. Um, this is actually, you see their, their headline in this uh, this issue, the rated issue, National Park Service to close fo Foggy Bottom encampment encampments. I was actually over at Foggy Bottom yesterday as well. I went to see my man Joe over at Bridge Street Books in Georgetown, who keeps get, picking my pocket. I don't appreciate that, Joe. 
you ain't spending my damn money all the damn time, Joe. But but I'm gonna show you a couple of the books I got yesterday because they're germane to the State of the Union, what we heard the other night. But uh, and they're raising the price to, to three dollars because the vendors pay 50 cents a paper and then they sell the paper. And so when they sell for two dollars, they get a dollar fifty. They sell for three dollars, they get two fifty, obviously. And they use that money to help them maintain their stability, food, you know, clothing while they work to get permanent shelter. But the lead story in today, in, to, in this week's Street Sense, is about how the federal government, in collusion with the city of D.C., is going around throwing people stuff away in the parks. They, they, they at home, they, they're at their home, they're where they live, which is outside tents in Lafayette Square, Franklin Park, whatever. And they rolled on all the people down there. McPherson Square, this is one of the most recent ones. And you go out for the day, you come back, all your stuff gone. Why? Because they done dropped down the feds and wiped all your stuff out and it's gone, and including any papers you had, any documentation you had. And they're moving people to permanent housing, but it's not fast enough. This is, you know, anyway, I'm saying all that to say this. I never like to be in a situation where I'm not reminded that in this funky settler state where people are sleeping outside in the Capitol, in the in shouting distance of where Joe Biden was on Thursday night, they are here selling newspapers trying to maintain not only a sense of dignity, but a sense of humanity. And so, you know, for me, I don't never want to be even momentarily. So I don't know. And, and that's, that's a challenge. I agree I mean, with myself. That's a challenge. You know, I don't like to be in a place where everybody, hi, Kiki, the, Damn, this is it. Where you going? I, I gotta leave for a minute. Why? Because it's too, you know. Did you see? Did you walk past some people who was asking for check? It's a lady standing in front of Georgia Browns over down on 14th Street who asked when she got a cardboard sign. Everybody going in there to enjoy their Friday night. I'm just like, I'm not going in there. I can't, I can't. I'd rather just order some and sit at this apartment. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. And that's a challenge I have, probably. Yeah. I don't know. You help me work through that though. You know, I, that that we can disconnect from the suffering of others, you know. And, and seek comfort, right? But I think we seek comfort at our peril. You know, until everybody's mm -hmm. comfortable, nobody should be comfortable. Until mm -hmm. everybody's free, nobody should be free. And that should be kind of the mantra that That's we all right. have. I'm not saying don't live your life, don't have, you know, because I'm always going to bake in self-care and yeah. moments of joy and all that. But in the midst of it, we should be able to walk and chew gum and have that. Then I ask that question because time and time, you know, Japan, Africa, you know, all these places were not just colonized, invaded, and folks right. got in, and, it, and it's, it's slick in Shogun because, you know, the Portuguese come in, they know their place, but they're scheming, and then here comes this entitled Brit British man, you know, who's like, yeah, I'm a white man, I'm, a, I'm, I'm about to take it all over, because that's been, that energy is wild to watch, and it's like, um, uh, no, no, we're, we're here, and then you you look up and yeah it happened it happened because you know uncomfortable people are gonna find a way mm. to take your stuff listen and that's what when that's what we're confronting right now that's what we're confronting right now the illusion is that when when that happens that people who have been made the most vulnerable in any society are just gonna go away that people who you have created to be the bottom of society where you are at the top, are just going to disappear. That's not going to, that's not going to happen for two reasons. Well, really for one reason. People reproduce and you can't kill everybody. As Malefia Asante used to say, we are the children of those who could not be killed. The Africans. You couldn't kill us all. If you could, we'd have been dead. You know, when Joe Biden says on Thursday night that there are a thousand billionaires in the United States of America. He said, you know how much taxes they pay, what their tax rate is? What? 8%. What? Yeah. So we're going to raise that up. And if we do that, we can pay for all these other programs. Joe Biden's not a saint. He's still the mummy. I have a real critique of Joe Biden because he's the head of state of the funky set, the state we call United States of America. He'd been deporting the shit out of Haitians in the first few months. He got rid of so many Haitians. Donald Trump, Title 42 in Texas, of course, you know, attacking the immigrants, getting rid of Haitians. But he was in bed with uh, Moise because Moise, who was the, he was the assassinated prime minister of Haiti, of course, had vowed that he would help the U.S. in trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela. So, of course, they was cool running in the face of everything that happened in the Haitian Revolution. And before that, you have, of course, the deporter in chief. That would be y'all's friend, the chocolate wonder. I know y'all like me talking about Obama, but you have to sit in a little discomfort. Remember what I said about discomfort? You need to be discomfortable. But the deporter in chief, just because somebody looked like you don't mean they 
you know, but I, I ain't gonna beat up Obama too bad because they're all presidents of the United States, which means they are the ones in charge of the apparatus of the state. And once you're in charge of the apparatus of the state, you've acquired a status that puts you in a tiny minority, a necessary minority in human social organization because power isn't good or bad, it just is. And somebody's got to manage it. And the rest of us who live in the formations that we call states today or countries, if you want to use that language, you know, give over to these managers that responsibility. But even those of us who give over to these managers that responsibility, either through accessing with our vote or with our inaction, which is a vote, we are not, quote unquote, equal in the society because those with a lot of economic resources then put their thumbs on the scale and they don't have to be elected politicians because they bought that class, that manager class to protect what they perceive as their interest, which isn't the interest of the rest of us. So I said all that to say when Joe Biden says it's a thousand thousand billionaires and we're going to raise that tax rate up from 8% to maybe 25% and use that money, then, you know, everybody should be like cool with that except the thousand billionaires. But guess what? It's millions of us and a thousand of you. So we'll give a damn what you're doing. Now, the trick is that you got to take away all their places to run and hide because when they offshore, as they always do, other places, those other countries going to have to agree. That's going to be the difficult part. But I went through all that to say this, a, a remarkable American Negro in Florida named Byron Donalds. This Negro, sitting next to his, you know, uncultured, unlettered hillbilly horde, including uh, the WWE's finest representative in the federal legislature, Marjorie Taylor Greene, <laughs> and so many others, you know, he decides to tweet that Joe Biden is attacking us. He wants to take our money. American Negro, are you one of the thousand billionaires? Oh, I see. You're owned by them. You would appreciate this, uh, Professor Hunter. I don't know if I shared this before, and I won't go into the details, but, you know, your friend, my friend, our sister, Ajua, by the way, Osmoa, who knows all these Negroes, we were coming back from the Juneteenth thing over at the White House when she invited us to go. We come in, and we see Byron Donalds get out of a car going into a restaurant with some white boys. Now, Ajua is crazy. <laughs> Audrey, like Byron. I'm like, Audrey, don't say nothing. Don't leave that man alone. Ah, he said, Byron, ain't you shame? You ain't shame? What's wrong with you, man? What you don't support none of what black people are doing? She's roasting him. And I'm saying, this dude kind of big. And I'm saying, if he turn around and say something to you, he takes two steps this way, you know, I can't do anything other than dot his chin. So I don't want to be famous for the wrong thing. Cause this is your big boy, you know. Any of y'all have been in a fight, you can't, you don't, you don't re wrestling with big, but you don't give him shit. You gotta anyway. So I don't even want to contemplate that. And you know, when Negroes know that they are wholly owned subsidiaries of white power, they have no skin. So, but see, I know Oswald. She know him. I mean, she knows him. So I'm not you, but you know, I, I'm like, boy, you. Gonna, we're gonna be we about to be in a fight down here in downtown DC. We just left. Man. I see my Tennessee State people, everything is beautiful. We all here, man. And here we're about to be in a fight with this boy who is inconsequential. Anyway, so I said, All right, leave him alone. The man, and this is what Byron he turned around, he said, I'm off the clock. Please, I'm off the clock. I felt bad for that, brother. Why? Because that clock you're talking about, that clock that the Dutch Put in place when they came into the Caribbean, that clock that had them measure how much you could work a, another human of African descent to exhaustion, and that clock that created the, the, the all day work day and then the reforms that made the eight hour work day, that clock that we began talking about a minute ago, the clock of the state of the capitalism that powers the power structure that we call the state today, that clock that must be dismantled, that clock is never off, brother. You own the clock. And this is what I said. I said, I leave the man alone. He's off the clock. He's going into that restaurant with his minders to get his next assignment. Let that man have his dinner in peace while he gets his next assignment. And she, and so she backed up. And I said, now, you know, somebody calling your name three or four times may be irritating, but what I just said, them's fighting words. <laughs> but by the time it hits you, you're already going to be in there and like, hey, and we gone. So good. That's what my, So anyway, I'll set out to say that Byron Donald sat there Thursday night and texted out, he's, you know, he's after our money and got drug on social media because everybody asked the question that I had, what, you you a billionaire? Now? Dude, calm down. You're protecting your friends, your billionaire friends? But when Joe Biden says that, what he's really engaged in is 
a slight critique of the formation of the state in recognition of the fact, as you have just said, that the vast majority of people in this state formation we call the United States of America don't have those resources. That a handful of people in this country have more material wealth than everybody else in the country. And that a handful of humans on the planet have more wealth than everybody else combined because you created a structure of wealth that measures your human value by material resources. And so I'm raising all that to say that, you know, today as we think about this, this, this theme for just a couple of minutes, we're reaching the hour mark, we won't stay here long today. The state of the state, and what is the state of the state? You know, in a week in the world that began with the Supreme Court, in a moment of overreach that is probably was designed to extend Donald Trump's indeterminate status in terms of the courts of the United States, but in fact will probably backfire. And I say it will backfire because when you read, as we did on Monday night in office hours, when you read the case, uh, the, the Supreme Court case that was decided, uh, Trump, well, the per curiam decision, Trump versus Anderson, Donald Trump, of course, arguing and his lawyers arguing that he is uh, Im immune from prosecution for doing anything he did because it was in his capacity as president that he was doing it. And uh, Norma Anderson, Norma Anderson's 91 years old. Norma Anderson, white woman, lifelong Republican, at one time the majority leader of both sides of the Colorado state legislature, retired in, uh, I think, 2006. She is one of the plaintiffs who sued to keep Donald Trump off of the ballot in Colorado. And you know, Maine, uh, there's a sister, the judge in Illinois, the judge who said that, that he couldn't be on the ballot in Illinois at the, 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 at the, at the lower court level. Uh, I read a quote in Politico from Norma Anderson. She said, uh, I was born four months before FDR was elected, before Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected. So I've lived through the Great Depression. I've lived through World War II. I've lived through two other wars. I've lived through good times, bad times. She says, so I think I understand our democracy. This was in response to the question, are you going to let them run you out of the Republican Party? Yeah, no, I ain't going nowhere. Now the rest of y'all crazy because over 200 elected officials wrote uh, or had their lawyers write amicus briefs supporting Donald Trump's position that he should stay on. But she was recruited to sue by a quote unquote liberal outfit to sue to keep, get Trump off the ballot and one at the lower court level, one at the Supreme Court level of Colorado, because she said, I'm a Republican and this guy's a racist. He is convicted of uh, assaulting women. He got all these problems. I, this guy can't represent us. Now we're going to disagree on policy, but on this, there should be no disagreement. What is the state of the state? State of the state is effed up. But the point is we're going to get to that. So the Supreme Court 9-0 procuring, well, no, not 9-0, really, really, really 5-4, really 6-3. But they all signed the opinion saying that the states don't have the ability to remove a candidate for president of the United States uh, under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And as we talked about extensively, we won't do it, repeat it here, but as we talked about it on Monday night in office hours, as we went page by page through the case, it's only a 20-page decision, particularly uh, the dissent, uh, the concurrence is really a dissent. It's very clear this was the only option they felt like they had. And it's very interesting on Thursday night to see uh, Sonia Sotomayor kind of looking at the floor most of the time. Uh, the frat boys were sitting to her left. That would be Beer Kavanaugh and Justice McConnell Gorsuch. Um, uh, John Perpetual Downturn Mouth Roberts, Mr. Balls and Strikes, was uh, sitting next to her to the right, if memory serves can correct me, and behind, and Kagan, Elena Kagan was there. And then behind them in the second row on the end was the Taji Brown Jacksons. And, and I guess they give Supreme Court members who are still alive the option if they want to come, even if they're retired because Anthony Kennedy was there. And it was just interesting to, to, to watch them because, you know, thinking about what ended up happening in that case, Sonia Sotomayor, uh, at least for the, the court watchers and the tea leaf readers, the speculation is based on what people have been able to piece together through communiques and, and emails and, and and various other sources that they have used to kind of piece together the speculation that it was Sonia Sotomayor who drafted 
what ended up being the concurrence that was signed by Elena Kagan and Katanji Onyika Brown Jackson, which said that the only thing we agree with in this opinion in Trump versus Anderson is the outcome. So he can't be taken off the ballot because if you start letting states do that, if you uh, if you if you give to them the power to do that and and take that power away from the federal government and give it to the states to say who can and can't be on the ballot on this issue, the issue of insurrection, uh, what you'll have is fifty different states may come fifty different ways. Oh, where you going? This is a fire truck out there somewhere. But the point is this. But then where they disagreed with everything else, they said, beginning with the fact that you went way beyond saying you can't remove people from the ballot to start saying which organs in the federal government have the ability to, in, to enact what is called in constitutional law a self, uh, self-executing self amendment. The 14th Amendment is self-executing. It's on its face. You really shouldn't need a Voting Rights Act. You really shouldn't need a Civil Rights Act of 1964 because you've got a 14th Amendment, you've got a 13th Amendment, and you've got a, a, a 15th Amendment. So it's it, it should be self-executing, although in each of those amendments and other amendments, uh, there's a section that gives Congress the ability to pass laws to facilitate the, uh, the amendment, the enforcement of the amendment. And that's where Roberts and his friends decide that they are going to say that Congress is the only one that can do it and they can only do it by passing legislation. The point that was made in the concurrence by Sotomayor, Kagan and Brown Jackson was, yeah, you didn't have to say that. You went way, you, in, in other words, to use a parlance from Ebonics and sociolinguists would say, you know, you're doing the most right now. You're doing the most. You didn't have to say all that. Because you're trying to now narrow it to say Congress got to pass a law to put somebody off the ballot, which is not true. And then they go through all the reasons why they don't think that that's true. And we could, we could talk about that. And, and, and it really shouldn't be true. For example, I'll give you just one quick example. We'll keep going. The, the, the idea, and this is written in the concurrence, the idea that you have taken away the possibility that the courts can rule. That the federal courts can rule, include us and say he can stay off the ballot, which is, I thought that's what we were talking about, right? I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was I would encourage everybody, you don't have to have any legal training to read this. You just have to have a time, a little bit of time, a little patience and sit very quietly and go through like we did on Monday night. And you can see these things kind of emerge. Anyway, all that to say that now that they've done that and issued this opinion, Jack Smith, the prosecutor who's, who is prosecuting Trump, federal government, on the idea that he should be punished criminally for uh, mounted, for fomenting an insurrection, which Joe Biden mentioned, January the 6th, 2021. He said uh, what that case can now go forward and they're going to rule. They scheduled trial. Uh, they didn't schedule trial. You got to have, you got to, they got to rule now. The Supreme Court has to rule on the question which Jack Smith asked him to rule on last year of whether or not he in fact can be disqualified for doing that. They schedule arguments for that. Those arguments were scheduled for this spring. They'll probably issue a ruling somewhere before, no later than June. And then after they do that, the trial can commence. That trial will take place this fall if everything moves forward. I want y'all to think about this. People, we're now talking about, you know, uh, that you saw in Minnesota, 19% of the people who voted in the Democratic primary voted uncommitted. That outstrips what happened in Michigan in the place where I was born and raised in Tennessee. You had double digits voting uncommitted. You know, when, when the primary comes around in May in Maryland, I'll probably vote uncommitted. I'm just saying because that doesn't mean that I'm not going to vote for Biden in the fall. But what it does mean is that there's a contestation going on between those people who got to do living and dying in this country and the small group that is charged and deputized to manage the affairs of state, that small group, by the rest of us, including an, in an unequal power relationship, those billionaires and others who got their thumb on the scale. This is a contestation we're talking about in the state of the state. This is the problem that we have. But at any rate, I'm raising all that to say that while uh, Jenny Thomas's wholly owned subsidiary, Boy Toy, uh, while the Onward Christian soldier, Sam Alito, while uh, Justice McConnell Gorsuch and his frat buddy, Beer Kavanaugh, 
while the handmaid, uh, Amy Comey Barrett, who wrote a separate concurrence, only a two paragraphs, basically saying, hey, y'all should not be, you know, she'd be turning the temperature down, not up, because she sees what's coming. While, you know, they seem to think that somehow, and Mr. Balls and Strikes himself, John Roberts, with the perpetual downward smile, seems to think somehow that what they say is going to be able to influence enough what's going to happen that they can stop what's coming and leave policy and add a footnote. Um, um, a new edition of this book, which is kind of like a, a, a foundational book about uh, the, the federal courts in the United States, Gerald Rosenberg's book, new edition just came out called The Hollow Hope, Can Courts Bring About Social Change? This is the third edition. It's a very interesting book because he brings it up to and through the Dobbs case, the, the abortion case. Um, you know, it's interesting. Rosenberg's basic thesis in this book, which now is oh, it's 700 pages, right at seven with the index seven, oh, no, 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 not seven, oh, 713 pages at this point. His basic argument is the courts are extremely influential, but they're not nearly as influential as people think they are because ultimately it is the people who live in the society through the institutions that govern the society that will weigh and prevail upon judicial decision making in an outsized manner so that the courts are going to follow the social trends more than set the social trends. And he has some fascinating stuff. I can't wait to see what he does in the third edition, because in the previous editions, he he takes on the civil rights era because we kind of hold that as the heroic era. And we do. I do as well in, in some ways, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, which I don't hold heroically at all, but that's for different reasons. And we've talked about that extensively. We can talk about that any, many more times you want. Um, the, the voting rights cases, the civil rights cases, the, uh, segregation, all those cases. He says those cases, not that they were inevitable, but that the society was moving in that direction because of social movements, either consensus opinion or growing public opinion or protest. All these things converge. And so the courts have to play catch up, particularly in a Brown case where you got international opinion involved. We'll come back to that in the case of Haiti in a minute. But as, I, as I'm talking about this and I'm going to now, that was the footnote. I'm coming back. So, you know, Roberts is nervous and Comey Barrett seems a little nervous about this ruling that they just had this, this, this Trump versus Anderson case, because now you're moving out beyond where the people are and you're going to teeter on the edge of irrelevance of the federal courts. Now, that doesn't mean that I throw in bed with my revolutionary friends who would say the courts are irrelevant, who the president is, is irrelevant, who picking the judge, the Democrats, probably all the same, blah, blah, blah. I don't go in bed with them either because, see, that doesn't displace the inevitable fact that if you don't engage in the political process that we have while trying at the same time to remake it, revolutionize it, overthrow it, replace it, have you want, if you take away your options in that regard, the confrontation may be more painful. And most of the people I know who engage in that argument are people who live comfortably, comfortably enough. And perhaps if this fighting breaks out in a way that will take away their comfort, they may see the fact that the people who will suffer the most won't be them. They'll be able to get on a plane and go somewhere else or, or go into the leafy suburbs and kind of hide out for a minute and continue to foment revolution from, uh, from uh, a laptop. But the point is this. What you see in this situation is the Supreme Court made a decision that might make it worse because imagine this, imagine this. Because they didn't act in a timely manner, and some of this is the fault, of course, of one of the great affirmative action hires of the 21st century, the great Merrick Garland, who did not act. Because they did not act timely in a timely fashion. Not talking about Georgia, Bonnie Willis, not talking about New York, Bragg or, uh, or, or, or Letitia James. I'm talking about the federal cases, not even talking about the federal case in the in 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 um in, in in Florida, where the judge is just determined to save Donald Trump with these documents. And I'm talking about the D.C. case. The jury pool in the in the fractured diamond that Virginia took back its part, called the District of Columbia, is going to be suffused, overwhelmingly, quote unquote, liberal, and a larger percentage plurality of non-whites. If you think that jury is probably not going to convict Donald Trump, you're not paying attention. Imagine this. We are now in October, September, October. SCOTUS can't save you. Your, Jenny Thomas's boy toy can't save you. Beer Kavanaugh can't save you, chief. The handmaid has wrung her hands, but hey, the temperature is rising. Can't stop it. 
You can't stand the heat. <laughs> yeah, brother. Because guess what? In the jury box is a jury. Hell, D.C., one of only two states that the, even the Republicans don't vote for you. They voted for Nikki Haley. So you're, you're about to be convicted. Now, imagine this. A conviction comes down in October. Let's say late October. Let's say the first week of November and the election is today after tomorrow. My friends, what we talking about right now in March about committed and uncommitted? Oh, that's going to be a long memory. You know, the, Amer the Americans got a fruit fly memory. Imagine this, a convicted felon on federal crime trying to overthrow the government. Now you got to decide whether to vote on him next week. Now, I'm not saying it's going to change anything or not. What I'm saying is we have to begin to think beyond the news cycle that we saw today or yesterday. And at this point, the Supreme Court may have made things worse this week, but we started the week with that. We started the week with that. And, you know, Donald Trump has one objective. We know that. And that's to keep his ass out of jail. He's put his daughter-in-law, who apparently was chosen by God, if you can look at what the, her remo the remarks were at the RNC meeting yesterday. Uh, Laura, she's now the vice chair. He's got his, uh, his friend, that fool out of North Carolina, who... Um, had all these election poll workers, watchers, whatever. He's going to be the chair of the RNC. And now they're about to turn all their money over to help him pay his legal bills. This is about to be a mess. About to be a mess. But he's trying to stay out of jail the same way the mass murderer Bibi Netanyahu trying to stay out of jail in Israel. They don't give a damn about nobody. They can say they care about the state, but they care about themselves. Bibi don't want to go to jail, so let me just kill 30,000 and counting Palestinians and wound many more. Um, by unifying the country and kicking people out the cabinet and just going to war and going to war, total victory, all that old BS that he's on. And in Donald Trump's case, I ain't going to jail if I had to tear the whole funky country up. And I don't care. You know, so uh, Rona, you got to go and put my daughter-in-law here and they put my friend from North Carolina in and the rest of it is history. So, you know, we had Super Tuesday. We saw that the next day. That was Tuesday, this Tuesday. All them uncommitted voters are voting, Tennessee and, and uh, Minnesota, all this kind of thing. And, and all of this leading to the state of the union in the United States. Now, what we're talking about today is a kind of kind of summarize this. I want to be done in, in the next 20 minutes is the state of the state. The state is a concept globally. I'm going to come back to Haiti in a minute. Joe Biden. And, you know, we were together for nearly six hours. Uh, Karen, you and I were talking about this probably um, with the Black Star Network. Roland Martin had live coverage and it was a great conversation we had. It was intergenerational. My girl, Tiffany Dean Lofton, who uh, Tiffany Lofton was uh, you know, late of the NAACP. She'd been organizing for, at this point, almost 20 years. And she worked on the, uh, you know, to help get Barack Obama elected and hasn't stopped. I mean, on the ground working, healthcare, unionizing, all that, the women's right to choose, all those things. And Tiffany was saying, you know, Biden gave the speech. I've heard him say most of that stuff before. He did some good stuff. But we got to keep pushing him. But never forget that Biden's only talking like that because he was pushed. That's absolutely right. Joe Biden's not a hero. No politician is a hero. Not really. The age of politician heroes seems to have passed. Some people can give some great speeches. But no, the age of the kind of, I represent everybody, the Adam Clayton Powell's of the world, even the Shirley Chisholm's of the world. And the age has passed. And by the way, parenthetically, then you stop looking at these biopics as if they're movies, as if they're store, as if they are their reality. I know what I said earlier about fiction and nonfiction, but that should be a gateway for you to find out for yourself the rest, the rest of it. Understand that when you see whether it be Bayard Rustin or Shirley Chisholm or Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, or whoever it is, Bob Marley, that any narrative has political commitments it's trying to make. And when you start talking about fictional narratives or based on the true story narratives about people who were in our living memory, you can always engage them more easily by reading, by listening, by looking for them as they lived in real life. It's very important. Anyway, back to the point. Joe Biden's not a hero. Politicians are heroes. What we have is a system that can change if we pound on it, if enough of us pound on it. This was the point that, that, that Tiffany was making the other night. Roland closed the, the the coverage somewhere 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 after 1:30 in the morning with a with him showing about an 11 or 12 minute clip from Jesse Jackson's 1988 speech at the Democratic National Convention. I remember it well because we was all headed to Atlanta because we figured it was going to be a brokered convention. I worked 
uh, it, it, locally in Tennessee when I was an undergrad on Jesse Jackson's campaign when he ran president in 84 and 88. I was in law school in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, nobody had enough delegates to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. We said, Jesse, will be the vice president or something's going to be some concessions got to be made. So we're going to we get ready to go to Atlanta. Jesse released all his delegates to do caucus. That's when Ron Brown became the chair of the DNC, Donald Brazil. Half them Negroes in the Democratic Party, senior Democrat came out of the Jackson campaign as a result of that. Right. Um, and, and all that. But anyway, he showed it because this is a high watermark of speech making in terms of the possibility and limits of the Democratic Party. And afterwards, after he showed it, we were, we, we were talking about this on, on the air. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that the Democratic Party, since the 1980s, since that, moved in the other direction. The Democratic Leadership Council, Bill Slick, Willie Clinton and his friends, all them, they said, oh, hell no, we can't let these insurgents, the great unwashed, the least of these, these people who have entered electoral politics over the arc of the last generation as a result of the Voting Rights Act, which you shouldn't have needed because you got a 15th Amendment, but nevertheless, you you, you implement it. All these people coming in, you're going to pull the Democratic Party into some shit. Meanwhile, the White Nationalist Party, since Barry Goldwater in 1964, has decided they're going to double, triple, quadruple, infinity down on white nationalism. Goldwater in 64 gets crushed. But hey, we're going to double down on this white nationalism. We got this white majority, the silent majority, as Richard Nixon called him, who came back from the political dead after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Parenthetically, nice troll, nice troll, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Biden, because I thought I saw uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's ex-wife sitting up two seats down from your wife in the box, I think, was you putting your thumb in Bobby Kennedy's uh, junior's eye. But anyway, the point is this. Then you have, after 1968, with Nixon, the silent majority, they done gone down completely on white nationalism. Reelected landslide 1972, Nixon, 74, he would have, you know, been all right, except the overreach of Watergate with his paranoid ass. So he puts Gerald Ford in there to finish out the term, and James Earl Carter comes out of the South. Jimmy Carter, of course, that's the last kind of halfway liberal ish Democratic president. Because then, of course, in 1980, you have riding out of the West on a horse, the make, original Make America Great Man, the gladiator invader of Grenada, uh, 666 Ronald Wilson Reagan, the, the number of letters in his name. Anyway, Reagan, pure white nationalism, pure white nationalism, reelected in 84. And then George, you know, thousand points of light, Bush comes in, continues that work, former CIA chief. And then by then, the Democratic Party is basically the Republican Party light, the old Republican Party light, Slick Willie and Al Gore two times. And then you get to 2000 where they steal the election. And the case closest to Trump versus Anderson was decided. And that was, of course, Bush versus Gore, which said, don't be citing this case for no precedent because we just basically stopping this uh, count so our mans can get in. Remember, Beer Kavanaugh, Amy Comey Barrett and John Roberts were lawyers in Florida arguing. Comey Barrett, not on their side, but still down there. Beer Kavanaugh and Balls and Strikes Roberts are lawyers arguing to get Bush in at that time. His damn brother's the governor of Florida at the time, if you remember. And they say when they decide this case, they say don't use this case for anything else. Was there anybody on the current Supreme Court who was on the court in 2000? Let me think. Oh, yeah. Jenny Thomas's boy toy was on the court. Anyway. So what does Sotomayor and Mayor them do in their concurrence in this opinion that came out on Monday? They cite Bush versus Gore. They tro start by trolling John Roberts from uh, from the abortion case from Dobbs when they quote John Roberts at the beginning of their concurrence by saying uh, John Roberts said that uh, when you have a decision, you should only cite uh, you should only decide what's before you to decide. You shouldn't decide anything else. That's a paraphrase of what they said. So they troll him because that's exactly what he didn't do in, in the major so-called majority opinion, which is really the majority procurium, but that's not the point. And then they end it with Bush versus Gore citing Stephen Breyer. Breyer was like, what the court did today, it should not have done. So I'm like, I see y'all trolling these people. You can't stop them, but you're going to put a marker down for the day when you can stop them, which brings me to the point. At the end of the broadcast, by showing Jesse Jackson, it was a reminder that the Democratic Party, that Jesse Jackson and that insurgent campaign came this close to pushing closer to what we would need as a people in, of just human beings in, in this country, in the United States of America anyway. I know there's people globally watching this. That promise, that attempt was thwarted by the Democratic Party leadership for a generation after that. For a generation after that. Slick Willie, Al Gore. Remember who Al Gore's campaign manager was? Another gift 
of the Jackson campaign down in Brazil. Barack Obama, the Porter in chief, Mr. Drone Kill List, just being the president of the United States and looking cool while doing it with my tan suit and my uh, fire wife, you know, and the beautiful kids and the mother-in-law. But, you know, make no mistake about it, though. Murder was the case that they gave me. Murder! <laughs> me, Abu Jamal got three volumes on it. Murder, Inc. Murder was the case that they gave me. Who is they? The ruling elite. Who is me? The managers, the managers of the state, the politicians. What is the assignment? Murder! Murder was the case that they gave me. This is just what it is. If you're the president of the United States, you come in, after you take your hand out, up, out the air, whatever you swearing on don't matter, but you got your hand there. Okay, here you go. What's this? Murder! Murder was the case that they gave me. But the Democratic Party that Joe Biden now heads, as we heard on Thursday night, that's closer to what Jesse Jackson was talking about, still remote, but it's closer to that than probably anybody uh, since, including Barack. Don't mistake phenotype for politics. So that haven't been said. Remember when Biden was teetering in the primaries four years ago that the insurgents, the Bernie Sanders and the Elizabeth Warrens, not perfect, but do you remember Bernie Sanders was the chair of Jesse Jackson's campaign in Vermont at the time when he was the mayor that up there in 84. Bernie Sanders, when, in order to win Joe Biden, and people attribute that to, of course, uh, our brother out of South Carolina, Jim Clyburn, and he deserves a lot of credit and blame for that. But it wasn't just that. It's the masses of people who were not voting for Biden. You can't make everybody stand up and salute. So it, it, is, it is clear. And then Biden begins to consolidate support after he becomes the nominee. What does he do? He begins to take into his platform a great deal of that stuff that Sanders was talking about and that Warren was talking about. There was no there was no student debt forgiveness in Joe Biden's heart. Remember, he the one time I ain't forgiving this damn debt. He had to do it because that's how politics works. It's incremental. He had to move toward that direction. Obamacare, at least we ain't gonna get rid of it. We're gonna have to expand Medicaid. Okay, we had to, okay, he kind of talking about that, but, the, but, but this kind of organizing work, the stuff Tiffany was talking about the other night, that stuff pushes us, right? And so this just came out this week. At least I got my copy in the mail. This is the Boston Review. They do some interesting special issues. This is a special issue of Boston, uh, the Boston Review called Can the Dem Democrats Win? But, I, but you know, I subscribe because I, they have some very provocative articles in here. And this is the, the lead essay called The New Blue Divide. There's some other stuff in here. There's an article on um, the history of Zionism and Walter Rodney's radical legacy. Very important. But for purposes of this, as I'm looking at the clock, it's called The New Blue Divide, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. Let me just read you the first paragraph says, a dramatic transformation has taken place in the U.S. Democratic Party. For several decades, it was moving rightward on economic issues. This is the post-Jackson era. Following the same trend as many center-left parties in wealthy democracies. So he said, this isn't just the United States. What is the state of the state, in other words, around the country, of the world? But over the past few years, it has made a sharp U-turn, boldly embracing broad and costly economic programs, industrial policy, and active regulation. Indeed, in 2021, Democrats pursued the most ambitious and redistributive economic agenda their party has attempted in more than half a century. This is what Biden was talking about the other night. They came two votes short, y'all. The cosplay coal miner, the millionaire out of West Virginia, the traitor to the poor whites of West Virginia and everybody else poor in West Virginia, Joe Manchin, country Joe, who's going off now to make even more money, and the Tooney loon from Arizona, who is so nakedly shameless shilling for dollars that there are other words in the English language that could be used to describe both Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin. But if they had gotten those two votes, and that's not to say that if they had gotten their votes, there wouldn't have been other people who were hiding behind them in the Democrat Party who would have voted differently. That is just going to, we have to speculate on that because we don't know. But had they been able to pass that Build Back Better agenda with the American Recovery Act and the American Families Act, you're talking about an, uh, an expansion of the social safety net, an expansion. And remember, the Tooney Loon is the one who went thumbs down on the minimum wage. You're talking about an expansion that would have not just rivaled, but exceeded the great society proposals of, of the 1960s and Lyndon Johnson. You would have to go back to the New Deal for that kind of thing. And not to say they wouldn't have gone to the courts 
and that they would have tried to throw it out. Again, my revolutionary friends who say that who's on the bench doesn't matter. What you've done is open your mouth and put on display the fact that you don't know how the courts work. Regardless of what uh, Gerald Rosenberg is saying in the hollow hope about the fact that society pushes the courts, which I absolutely agree with, the courts are important. Two things can be true. In fact, they're all part of an organic whole. This is why study is essential for understanding what's going on. So it goes on and says, and I'll read that sentence I just read because that was a footnote to this sentence. Indeed, in 2021, Democrats pursued the most ambitious and redistributed of the economic agenda their party has attempted in more than half a century. Contrary to, freement, uh, to frequent denunciations of democratic wokeness, whether from the right or the left, economic issues, interesting, not cultural ones, have become the core of the party's agenda. This shift is surprising because of another striking development. Democrats have simultaneously sought out and won over an increasing share of affluent suburban voters, the very voters who might be expected to oppose bold redistribution and constrain the party's economic ambitions. Now more than ever, the Democrats' racially diverse electoral coalition is a mix of the affluent and the economic struggling. Then they go on to explain to what that means. And I'll just summarize here for the interest in the interest of time. What um, Hacker and Pearson are arguing and observing, looking at the data and looking what they, they think the data is saying, is that the richest parts of this country, the exurbs and suburbs of these major metropolitan areas, which are almost all Democratic, and by the way, parenthetically, they make the observation that local politics, crime, I see what's happening in Philadelphia, oh my God, people killing each other, Chicago, you know, and Donald Trump says, see these blue Democrat rule cities? Yeah, local politics can be separated from national politics when you're not giving people resources and the debates have to be taking place, whether it's LA or Minneapolis, whether it's uh, Chicago, New York, or Nashville, Tennessee, the whole idea of how you combat crime, uh, places like Washington, D.C., this is shaped around public policy and local public policy differs from federal public policy and even state level public policy in enough of a way that you're only attaching it to the federal issue because you want control of the federal power apparatus, the political process. But anyway, I won't go more deep. I would encourage people to get this, get this uh, volume, Can the Democrats Win, and read that first, uh, that first essay and then read the critiques and, and engagement back and forth. But basically what they're saying is that the Democratic Party has become the home of the safety valve in the society going and this again all this is animated by you prop asking you know and, and making an observation you know of you know how we change the society and what about the people who don't have material resources enough to be able to even live at a at a minimum level of comfort and minimum level of security and by security i mean be able to eat be able to have a place you can put your stuff that the feds ain't gonna come with the state and throw all your stuff away you know the people at, at, at most vulnerable in this society well the democrats have become the home of the people pushing for that the Republicans, and, and that means that these people, in terms of a social movement that comes before Jesse Jackson, before Rosa Parks and Coretta Scott King, who were there that night in 1988, before their parents and their parents and their parents going back to reconstruct, past Jim and Jane Crow to reconstruction, past reconstruction into enslavement, past enslavement, don't their ancestors have ancestors, into what we were doing before we so rudely interrupted that that animating force continues despite of the optics that somehow things are worse and that you can push in a two-party system until you can dismantle a two-party system, one of the parties to be the safety valve to make some concessions, whether it be Brown versus Board of Education, the concession to the black elite while the schools remain segregated, which ain't necessarily a bad thing if you understand the fact, oh man, where's my man's book? I was just rereading. Anyway, I'm like, I won't, I won't do that. A uh, brother down at Southern University wrote a very important uh, book on desegregation in the colleges. And I was moving HBCUs as I was moving stuff to storage. That's, oh, no, I need to keep this book here. I got to reread this. But at any rate, one of the parties can become the safety valve. The Democratic Party is definitely see, clearly the safety valve. Joe Biden is not the Joe Biden who was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee that put Clarence Thomas on the court in the first place. Mommy, do you remember that, mommy? You ain't no hero. You talking like you was talking Thursday night because you've been pushed. You've been pushed by movements beyond your control, just like the courts will be pushed. Them hillbillies in Alabama that took away IVF real quick passed the law after their hillbilly Supreme Court entirely made up of white nationals, eight white nationals on the Alabama Supreme Court, even though the, the state is at least a third black, probably more, because you gerrymandered white nationalism like they've done in Wisconsin and other places and Texas into this idea that somehow y'all run shit just because you got elective office. That's because most of us don't vote. Again, very important to engage in all forms of warfare, including using the franchise, because when you don't vote, you vote. 
He said, that's not true. Okay, open your mouth, put your brain on display, or better yet, come into Nubia on Monday nights and office hours, and let's talk about it. I want to understand the logic of that, because it's very smarmy when you're sitting behind a computer and you read three lines of Karl Marx, and you think somehow that makes you some kind of, uh, give you some insight, but then you walk past the homeless on the way to your organizing committee meeting to talk about how Democrats and Republicans are the same. But the point is this, not disparaging the people who can do both. But that number is not as big as people want you to believe it is. The point is this. The Democratic Party becomes a safety valve. The Republican Party now, and this is in the article that Hacker and Pearson write out, they become the home of identity politics. The Democrats doing economic stuff because they've been pushed. The Republicans have become the cultural nationalists, the white cultural nationalists. They are engaged in full-blown white identity politics. And that is because they have to win elections. Why? Because as the managers of the apparatus of the state, as wholly owned subsidiaries of the billionaire class and the millionaire class and those who don't want the tax breaks that, uh, in fact, Joe Biden, what he say on Thursday night? Oh, y'all don't want to give $2 trillion tax break? I thought that was your idea. Yeah, it was your idea too until you realize it's bad politics. And how did you realize it? Because all them people who you need to vote for you think it's bad politics and they want it to stop. So therefore now you sounding more like Bernie Sanders. Why? You have to. You ain't doing it because you want to, Joe. This is not a question of morals. Politicians are rented agents of power. They manage political power and we rent them with our votes. So you don't like it. You know, he didn't go far enough on Palestine. Damn right he didn't go far enough on Palestine. Why didn't he go far enough on Palestine? Because APAC, APAC running Wesley Bell against uh, Corey Bush in St. Louis. Why? Get her out the paint. While he's talking about Palestine, Rashida Tlaib is crying, sitting there in the State of the Union, and there's uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who is comforting her at that moment. You know, it's it, it's tragic. All loss of life is tragic, but let's be very clear. You got a mass murderer on top of the head of state in Israel who tried to stay out of jail like his friend Donald Trump stayed out of jail. And Donald Trump, who when he was in office, supported Moise, who said, yeah, I'll, I'll help you with Venezuela, whatever you need. Donald Trump, who said, I'll let Russia do whatever he want in the Ukraine. Donald Trump, who will let loose the dogs of war and send all the bombs to Israel if he win. Well, you know, Bibi Netanyahu don't want Joe Biden to win. Bibi Netanyahu, he's not just sticking his middle finger up at the Biden administration. He's waiting on uh, Donald Trump to win so he can go out there and kill every Palestinian in the West Bank and Gaza if he could. But guess what? It's more human beings than just in the West Bank and Gaza. And when you go to Haiti, I saw pictures of some Haitians waving a Palestinian flag this week. Why? Because guess what? Global solidarity matters. And let me turn my attention to that for a minute. And by the way, the intergenerational dialogue was very important, Prof. Uh, there's a sister who told me, Terry, hello. She and her husband are probably watching now. Uh, her husband, I think, comes in on the YouTube side. Uh, Sharon, uh, Sean, rather, Sean Patterson, who is the mayor of Mount Vernon, New York, the head of the National Mayor's Association. Her husband, Marvin, is a faithful listener and a faithful viewer. Told, yeah, she told me, tell you hello, says he don't miss and so it's just very edifying to know that reach that you have five days a week on Sirius and then seven days a week with Narrative Nubia and all the stuff we are doing, you know, that that is having a, an impact. It was a really important uh, conversation. Oh, by the way, Joe, we know it's not illegals. It's undocumented. In fact, Joe cost me a lot of money yesterday. This is a new book by Jonathan Blitzer called Everyone Who Is Gone Is Here. The United States, Central America, and the Making of a Crisis. This 500 page book is about the people who arrive every year at the US Mexico border and why. We talked about that last week. We're talking about the stuff that happens in Central America, in Latin America that forces people here and the stuff that happens other places in the world because the state of the countries they're in, the state of the state has been radically intersected by US foreign policy. Not completely US foreign policy because another book Joe sold me yesterday that I'm now going to have to read in tandem with this book is a compact history of Latin America's Cold War, finally translated from the Spanish, Manny Patina. Um, this book talks about how U.S. foreign policy is a major role in that push factor, but that in these countries, and th th this, this book is good because it's going, it's combining the, the English language scholarship with the Spanish language scholarship to help us understand what things in these states are more under control of the people in those states, even though they have been impacted by the United States. But the so-called immigration crisis that we're talking about really is not a crisis. In fact, two other books, 
um, this book I had, because this has been around since about almost 15 years. No one is illegal, Joe. This is Justin Chacon's book with Mike Davis, the late Mike Davis, talking about racism and state violence at the U.S.-Mexico border. And who those people are. And by the way, the Democrats being the safety valve in terms of social uh, programs and economics, having to move in that direction to continue to, uh, to manage the affairs of state at the behest of the people who vote for them and the wholly owned subsidiaries. Some of them are by APAC and the billionaire class and all that kind of thing. Again, being contested because power isn't good or bad. It's power. It is. You've got to engage to get some for God's sake as the Shalites would say, give more power to the people. Well, if you're going to do that, you got to be engaged because the billionaire is going to buy your power. Balls and Strikes Roberts made sure that in 2010 with Citizens United, putting a cap on it, but it's always been the case. But if you're going to appeal to these groups, you can't appeal based on identity politics. The Democratic Party is finally beginning to recognize that a little bit, even though they take Black people for granted. Granted, now you talk about Latinos. What is Latino? This is a new book by Marie Arana. Highly recommended. Joe recommended. It's called Latino Land, a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. I'm looking forward to reading this because uh, Marie Arana, who is from Peru, very interesting. Uh, she talks about how she, she says this. Census reports project by 2050 as much as 30% of the U.S. population will claim Latino heritage, but Latinos are not a single people. Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Salvadorians, Cubans, and many others. Each has a different cultural and political background. Some are indigenous with ancestors who were here long before the continent's earliest immigrants. Others arrived in the 1500s. More came later from many parts of the world. They're racially diverse, a random fusion of white, black, indigenous, and Asian. Once overwhelmingly Catholic, they're becoming increasingly Protestant and evangelical. I would say also agnostic and atheist. Formerly solidly Democratic, they now vote Republican in growing numbers. Goes on. I can't wait to, to dig into a Latino land because, again, the Democratic Party is playing with a, a coalition that isn't a coalition. You got rich people in the suburbs and exurbs who they need to vote because these people will help them get so-called battleground states, meaning states that aren't part of the white national structure of this funky criminal enterprise that is set up in electoral politics at the federal level by the so-called electoral college where the hillbilly hordes in Iowa, the hillbilly hordes in North and South Dakota, the hillbilly hordes in Idaho and w Wyoming, the hillbilly hordes get elected get electoral status that is out that, that get a political humanity that far exceeds their physical humanity their citizenship is worth more with two senators we can block anything in the country than the citizenship of people in california and new york who also only get two senators so they baked white supremacy into the criminal enterprise so if you're going to appeal to the latinos to the blacks to the asians you can't appeal to them just on race just on ethnicity or culture you must now begin to appeal to them on common elements of economic interest even though you keep the culture there as a part because it is a memory of the fact that you're dealing with a white supremacist monster on the other side which is why those poor whites are screaming i'm gonna make mark great again even though they ain't got a pot to piss or a, a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of and should naturally be like their parents and grandparents were in the coalition with the Democrats. But it's over now because the white nationalist party is now the Republican party. They're doubling down on identity politics, leading us finally to the State of the Union. I only spent a couple of minutes on this tonight. We all saw it. Why we must educate ourselves. You can read the speech you can listen to the speech you can go back and forth on the politics of who was trolling who and what went back and forth the omissions uh our brother jamal bryant he was in town so he came down to the studio he was part of the conversation he said i was disappointed i didn't hear anything about haiti didn't hear anything about sudan or congo and of course you wouldn't hear anything about haiti because the biden policy is the same as the policy of uh trump and Obama and Clinton and Carter and everybody else when it comes to Haiti. Haiti's still being punished. Let's just spend the last couple of minutes on Haiti. I want to talk about that. Because what is the state of the Haitian state? In fact, there's a brand new book called Aid State. This is Jake Johnson's book. Elite Panic, Disaster Capitalism, and the Battle to Control Haiti. Jake Johnson. And there are some incredible observers, scholars, first-rate intellectuals. My friend, Jamie Pierre. Jamie Pierre is the University of British Columbia. Um, Robert Fatten, Robert Fatten's the University of Virginia. Uh, they had a conversation yesterday that I wasn't able to go to. It was an online conversation, but I was tied up. I couldn't uh, tune in. I wish I could have. But look up Jamima Pierre. Look up the Black Alliance for Peace, doing some very important work. I mean, she's a member of the Black Alliance for Peace. They're doing some very important work on uh, solidarity politics globally everywhere. But I want to end with Haiti just for a minute. 
because we're seeing it was in yesterday's New York Times. Where's yesterday's New York Times? The New York Times is completely reliable to always get Haiti wrong. Uh, they it seems like they make it their business, and so you can't trust nothing the, the uh, New York Times has to say about Haiti. Before I get to Haiti, I do want to mention what is going on in Nigeria right now. Hundreds are feared seized in Nigeria as kidnapping epidemic worsens. It's in the northern part of the country, Kaduna. You see there, uh, also Bornu, Ngala. Very important. I mean, you know, a th almost. A third of the young ladies who were kidnapped the, uh, by Boko Haram never have disappeared. They still don't have an accounting for them. And, and of course, I just wanted to mention that in passing because, again, the, the, the state of the state is messed up all over the world because these states are not just individual states. They are states that are part of a, lo a larger global fight over resources, a larger global struggle over resources. That's what we're talking about. You heard Joe Biden give the obligatory China bash at the end, but China, as we talked about last week, making them $11,000 hybrid electric cars, bruh, you got to do more than saber rattle on that. And these white nationalists not going to help you because they're clear that they don't care. They are trying to get reelected to run their game plan, tax cuts and all the other stuff. And they got to use the immigration crisis, which is why when Biden trolled them about immigration, you know, one thing about white nationalists, they have no impulse control. Y'all fell for that banana in the tailpipe thing again. Last year, it could have been random. Y'all screaming at him and he roasts you. He got you on entitlements, this kind of thing. But this year, come on. At least Byron put it on Twitter. He didn't scream out his mouth. But y'all gonna have these hill, you hillbillies ain't got no impulse control. Come on now. This is the article was in yesterday's time. Power plays abound as gangs so chaos in Haiti's capital. This guy right here, Jimmy Cherizier, uh, known as Barbecue. They call him the main thug leader. And here, look, this, look at this picture right here. You see that picture of him right there with the with the uh, bulletproof on and, and the backpack on his front? This was taken by Ralph Teddy Erol for Reuters. Now, here's today's, this is yesterday's New York Times. Here's today's Financial Times. I don't see the credit. Here he is again. Gangster Barbecue's class crusade sets Haiti aflame. He didn't set Haiti aflame. This this way said on uh, FT today. The gangster leading a proletarian uprising in the chaos of Haiti takes his inspiration from Francois Duvalier. Go back to in class 55, 54, 55, 56. Those three. We talk about Haiti extensively. And also a special session we did of in class. So four of them in total. And then we come back to it. But I don't want to end today with this just for a moment. So you see how the language is framed. Why is this language framed up like this? Because they're trying to get an invasion together. Well, actually, they've been occupying Haiti since they threw out, they being the United States and its lackeys, the state of the state. They've done that for the last 20 years. This is the 20th anniversary of the overthrow of the last democratically elected leader of Haiti. And that would be Jean-Bertrand Aristide. The United States did that. And uh, of course, that was a collusion between uh, Slick Willie earlier. And, you know, because the Clinton Foundation had a lot of financial, has a lot of financial interest in Haiti. The thing about Haiti is you don't give a damn in the United States, the state of, uh, state of affairs. You don't care as long as them cheap draws and baseballs coming out of the Dominican Republic, Haiti and everywhere else. And the things that you want from Haiti and you can't let Haiti be an example of self-determination, but the Haitians got something for your ass. Anyway, this is what FT says. The gangster leading a proletarian uprising in the chaos of Haiti takes his inspiration from Francois de Valier, the brutal dictator who ruled from 1957 to 1971. Jimmy Cherizier, known as Barbecue or Barbecue, is a former police officer who organized a mass jailbreak this week while Premier Ariel Henry was away in Kenya pleading for assistance. Cherizier once assured reporters, quote, I would never massacre people in the same social class as me, end quote. And then on page three of the FT, there is a long article, Haiti Gangster Barbecue, Fans Planes of Uprising. Okay, let's spend five minutes on this. Put my timer on. Haiti and gangs. Let's do it. As I said, go back for the history, some of this history, at least for me, but I would encourage you all to look up some of these people I've suggested, among others. And some people are probably putting it in the chat in uh, in 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 both uh, Nubia and in, in, in YouTube, probably putting in other resources. And I encourage you to do that. And I've talked about Robert Fatton before and mentioned Jamima Pierre. 
Biden can't say anything because he's on board. He deported more Haitians in the first months of office than Trump did. He continued Obama's deporter in chief, all that kind of stuff. The U.S. deposed Aristide, and they used a guy named Guy Philippe, who who got weapons from the Democrat Republic, uh, from the from DR, the, the Dominican Republic, and from Florida. All these new weapons coming in. It's very important to understand that. Ariel Henry, who they installed three years ago, can we believe that? We've been in class and we talked about that as it was going on. The assassination of Juvenal Moïse, the former prime minister. They installed Ariel Henry. Ariel Henry is out of the country. But there are rumors that the United States has asked Henri to resign. He signed an agreement that he would only be in that position for 30 months. The Haitian people want a government that they created. The Haitian elite, just like the United States elite, rent the politicians who are the Haitian politicians, but they're fighting with each other right now. The mass of the people said, well, shit, we ain't got no government. We got to protect ourselves. That's why they are strapped in the neighborhoods. Jamima Pierre was talking about that the other day. She was saying, you know, my mother just came back from Haiti. In the neighborhoods, they got guns stuff because they got to protect themselves. You call it gangs, but these people got to protect themselves. And in the countryside, you can get and do what you need to do, all this kind of thing. But what the what the Western press is showing is chaos everywhere. She said they're showing it as chaos because they want to come in there and invade. But guess what? The people say, hey, man, you sign a deal. You know when that deal ran out? February the 7th, 2024. That was when the prime minister, the unelected prime minister, the illegitimate prime minister of Haiti, installed by the United States, and the UN through the Security Council and its stooges, that man was supposed to leave a month ago. And guess what? The people is like, you got to go. I'm not taking barbecue's side. I'm just saying barbecue got guns that you gave him that people got to protect themselves from. At the same time, he the face now of a movement to get this guy out and get this illegitimate class out and get the United States out. And that carries a lot of weight in a region where you've been interfering since nine, uh, since 1804. So let me wind this up. The U.S. continues to steer it. The other day, Henri tried to get back into Haiti. He tried to land in the, in, in the Dominican Republic. The Dominicans told him, your plane can't land here, chief. Now, people are always talking about the, Dem the, 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 the Dominican Republic and Haiti at each other's throats, and that's true, but there's also solidarity politics. They made a calculated cost. Probably the United States got on the phone and said, don't let that plane land. Plane land. So when Henri tried to get to Haiti through the DR, the DR told him the plane can't land. He went back to Puerto Rico. Oh, you can't come back to Haiti, sir. You all put this on barbecue? When you know damn well the fires in Haiti were set by your funky ass in the United States of America and your stooges at the Security Council of the United Nations. So we continue. He couldn't get back in. Kenya. Now they're saying Kenya going to lead the international force because they're going to sign a bilateral agreement with the Haitian government to, to come in and stop the violence, attack the gangs, fight the gangs. First of all, it ain't no Haitian government, so you can't sign no bilateral agreement. The guy you got as prime minister spoke that left in February, and he wasn't legitimate before then. You killed the other guy who you flipped on, uh-huh, yeah, with some agents that came out of Florida, among other places, and Columbia, and other, come on, dude. Y'all ain't like anybody paying attention. But the bottom line is this, King is on the payroll. Their cabinet member, head of security, and head of state, secretary of state equivalent, were here in the United States a couple of weeks ago, and guess who's coming on the 26th of May to have a state dinner with the mummy? That would be William Ruto, the prime minister of Kenya, and his wife, Rachel. They will be down the street at the White House at a state dinner. And there will be some Negroes there raising glasses and drinking as people outside got cardboard signs or trying to sell street scents on the corner and talk about cooperation between the United States and Kenya. But that conversation also includes, can we get y'all to invade Haiti? Because damn, the core group, Germany, Brazil, Canada, Spain, United States, France, the EU, the UN, and the Organization of American States can't get nobody to go in. Because remember, the United States asked Brazil. Brazil, Lula was like, hell no, nah, I'm not going to the Haiti. We ain't carrying y'all water no more. And Mexico, AMLO was like, oh, hell no, nah, we ain't carrying your water no more. Then went to their white friends, Justin, Justin. Oh, Canada, will you lead the force to invade? No. So what did they do? They went all the way to Africa and tried to be some white-faced Pan-Africanist. 
and got Kenny on the payroll so we give y'all some money. The truth, man, we'll fund it, but we can't be seen as our thumb on the scale. And guess why they can't, friends, as we end the state of the state in the world today? The U.S. ain't got that kind of muscle no more. Oh, friends, they don't have that kind of muscle anymore. So what's going on in Haiti is the people of Haiti are trying to figure out how to cobble together a government, which they can do. This is what the point is being made in aid state. They can, it ain't a deficit on the Haitian people. It's that you all been effing with Haiti for 200 years, longer than that when you had us enslaved. They fought their way out once. They've been fighting their way out ever since, and they're going to fight their way out now. And solidarity politics, not people cling, clinging to their flag and their flag only. Solidarity politics will help us all in our common humanity beat back these forces that control the politics at the top of every state and make things miserable for the people. We'll wind up with a couple of observations, uh, Prof. Uh, there are a couple of new ancestors. I want to mention uh, Gillen Kane. Kane was an original founder of the Black Last Poets. Joe was telling me yesterday he made transition in February. I didn't realize that. You know, so those are that early album where you got uh, um, Die N Word and Poetry is Black and all that stuff that comes out of the Dylan Kane era. So uh, ancestral. Uh, entreaties for him as he begins his journey. And then I got this message from Larry Crow, uh, day before yesterday, one of his jagnas, one of the great forces in cultural meaning making and movement and memory among Africans in the contemporary world, uh, out of Chicago, born in Mound Bayou, Mississippi in 1932. Uh, that would be our sister Val Gray Ward, Quinola Valeria Gray Ward. Val Gray Ward, V-A-L, Gray Ward, uh, Gray with an A, a, a founder of, with her husband of Kuumba Theater, um, a writer, a, a, a performer, a singer, a dramatist, an institution builder in Chicago for many years. And, you know, having just come back from Chicago, Kim, I'm sure, you know, uh, Kim and I were back and forth about uh, about this, this passing. And I'm sure there's going to be a ritual. I don't know what if arrangements have been made, Larry or Olivisi, if you're in the in the in the chat let us know uh, but val gray ward made transition day before yesterday i think it was and so uh let's uh let's take a moment and, and think about her so we are done for today thank you for we ain't, never, we ain't never done no ma'am no ma'am <laughs> never done man uh Ooh, I'm, I have all day now. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So full, so full. Oh, um, yes. You are amazing. And uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for just opening. I don't know if they're chakras. I don't know. What, <laughs> you're opening things, Dr. Carr, and it's a, it's a good thing. I appreciate you. We try. I appreciate you, too. Oh, I should mention, Joe got, got this book, too. Let me just show you one more book. Because remember, now, how many times, Prof? Have we talked? In fact, come on back. That's one before I show this book. How many times we had that kind? We read Barracoon. We were in conversation with all those folk, including descendants of the survivors of the Clotilde. You know, I mean, it was a beautiful thing. Again, for those of you who are not yet in narrative and in Nubia, specifically as, as, as the kind of public as our as our conversation in, 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 with uh, with the archive and with each other, you know, to be in conversation with Africans from Mobile. And Africa Town, and Brother Lewis, Chief Lewis, and all them, and then all the descendants who came in, and they hear the di the, the differences and the consensus, and to be that, I mean, Mobile County Training School. I keep that Greyhound right here on my desk. All of that, and then the Reed Barracoon, and be in conversation page by page, and then to see National Geographic doing Quest Love got relatives down there. Now it's popular. Prof, this book just came out. Look at it, the survivors of the Clotilda. The Lost Stories. First of all, they ain't lost. Anyway, The Lost Stories of the Last Captives of the American Slave Trade. This is Hannah Durkin, you, you, native yeah. of Mobile. Well, who had, oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. She's you, not know, a, you, know I, you know I interviewed her. I didn't. Come on back. Tell me, because I didn't know that. What are you talking about? Child. Ch Please. Come on, bro. Look, let's end with this, because this book is 2024. So that shows you how the machine works. How did you, first of all, how did you find her? Well, you know, the the uh, they have a talent department and folk, you know, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Look, look, watch this. I mean, I want you to keep going, but it reminded me of that last poet song. 
automatic push button remote control, synthetic genetic control your soul. In other words, the machine is called me machine. You didn't even know they, they have flooded the zone. All right, so go ahead. So, what so uh, <laughs> because of you, uh, it didn't go the way she expected. Uh, those of you who are Wait, <laughs> who are Sirius XM subscribers and listen to that interview. It was a, a whole disaster for her. Yeah. she And she didn't have the depth of knowledge to even have the conversation with a whole ass book. How many pages? Oh, no. The survival. I, I just got this. Yes, about 400 pages. Look, here's a telltale. Here's a telltale. Because, you know, sometimes they get some Negroes who also want to be put on to put blurbs. There are no blurbs on the back of this book, bro. Man, I kept bringing up Jordan Hurston. Hurston. I kept, you know, who oh, put man. You on? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't <laughs> oh, good. No. She was it's so an archive, right? Because I'm a subscriber. I got to go back to Sirius. I got to go listen to this. I'll I'll dig it up. I'll dig it up and share it in Nubia. That's what mm. I'll do. Oh, by the way, I, I should show you all the bottom of y'all saw this my shirt. Okay. Uh, shout out to Hot Tim, uh, brother Hot Tim, who went to school together at Ohio State, who works here. This is the, uh, this is the, the I as I was moving stuff, I was also throwing away stuff and clothes and stuff. And so I came across this, the Afrocentric Nubians. The Nubians is the um, mascot, mascot, the nickname, the, the symbolic representation of Columbus Afrocentric School. Uh, this goes back to the African-centered community of Columbus, Ohio. And so shout out to everybody. And I had to check because I had to go back and make sure they were still, they came to see me. Um, I, you know, call Reba. Kel says, Reba is, is uh, Afrocentric. says, yeah, how Tim works there. I said, oh, damn. Okay. They came to Howard about 20 years, almost 20 years ago to visit because I used to live in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, the African Center community, this is one of the schools like San Cofa Freedom Academy in Philly that Africans got together and pushed and got. And so they they gave me this uh, this hoodie and I hadn't seen this hoodie in a long time. So I said, oh, no, I'm going to represent. I started to put my man Bayou joint on for what Val Gray Ward, but I had it on the other, other week. So I just wanted to mention that the Afrocentric Nubians, this is a, uh, there are some schools in the country that have Nubia in there. And that's one of them in Columbus. Look, I, I love that we are now wearing clothes with a purpose. You know? Yes! It's not just, you know, <laughs> and we support all all across everything, you know, that is about of course. delivering those kind of messages. So uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate uh, you too. Uh, thank you. I'm in the chat about to gather some people up. Uh, on oh, good. The, on what's the what's Nubia side, you know. Yeah, what, what's what's going on? What are we? No, I say I can always, uh, I always know who's not a Nubian by by the, um, well, I didn't say this, by the lack of depth of their commentary. Um, oh, know. Nitra, Nitra, Nitra listened to you on it. She said, the lady didn't know why she wrote the book. Then was talking to Karen them as if they didn't know about the clothes. <laughs> oh, I got to hear this. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> I so love, you, like, you always say, I love us. I but love you know us. what's sad? You know what's sad? There are probably everybody out there who has a platform who interviewed people like this. Oh, no question. Are not, you know, getting this kind of knowledge on a regular basis from somebody like you. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, what a discovery. You know what I'm saying? Like, what do those interviews sound like if the person on the other end of it doesn't have the scholarship to even question and challenge that you did a book? Come on. Why would you do a book? This is what I'm Why saying. You... There's like a thousand books on the same subject because Come nobody on. is willing to just go ahead and say as a publisher, no, why don't we highlight the book that came out 10 years ago on this subject, bring that back into, you know, into the, you know, <sighs> we, well, that's why we got the clean glass of water about to come because you back in the game now. Yeah. <laughs> look at you. Look, look. Yeah, I'm cooking. I'm cooking. I love you. I love you too. All right, Dr. Carter. Thank you. All right. And bye, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.